Welcome to the XCH London's Cheerless event. Um, thank you all so much for turning up today. Um, we've had uh, a really great turnout oh, yeah. coming from all over all over the world. We've got some people flying over from Europe as well, so that uh, shows the uh, dedication to, to, to cheer that we have with a strong community. So um, we'll be taking a deep dive into cheer this today, and uh, we'll first start by thanking um, our host today, Cinequan, that they've generously provided this venue for us today and it wouldn't be possible without them, so thank you to Cinequan. Um, we'd also like to thank Chia for their sponsorship. And, um, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're leading the way um, with, the, with the vision and innovation of the blockchain space and it's uh, yeah, thanks to them that we can sort of have this, this forum where we can all get together and learn in a collaborative space. Um, so we're delighted to have two amazing instructors here today. So we've got, we've got Matt uh, from Chia, um, and Matt's had he's from the Smart Contract and Wallets team. He's been here for uh, Chia for about four years. He has deep, deep expertise in, in Chia Lisp, and so we're really grateful to have him here. Uh, we've also got um, uh, Andreas um, from uh, Mint Garden. He's recently launched XH Pay. I think this. Access to payment, um, and we're working on other apps and many, many apps in the, in the ecosystem. So we're, we're, you know, thankful to have his, uh, his knowledge here. Um, later on, we'll be having a speech from Nick from CircuitDAO. He'll be talking about um, the over over collateralized stablecoin that he's preparing and launching uh, from Cir uh, the CircuitDAO working on. Um, yeah, so I think we'll get started now. So I'll hand over to to Matt. All right, thank you for such a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so hopefully you've all ran the, uh, the setup I had on screen earlier. What is Chia and what does it do? Well, it is a level one blockchain, so it's got a consensus algorithm and it's tracking money. Um, it stores transactions in blocks and the blocks are secured by peers who secure the blockchain. Uh, and in, in, in that regard, it is similar to other blockchains. Um, but where things... differentiate is how money is represented on the blockchain and Chia uh, has coins uh, and these coins are um, really quite a literal uh, programming object that the tra chain tracks um, and the coins in Chia contain the programs. Uh, you might hear me call them puzzles throughout the rest of the today, but a puzzle is just a program that is inside of a coin. Uh, coins are really quite small and efficient because they only contain three things. Uh, the parent ID, which is a byte 32 containing information on where this coin came from, the hash of the program, um, and the amount of the coin. And that's all it is to make a coin. The other important property that the coins have is when you use them, they vanish, they're gone. And this uh, might seem counterintuitive, but it actually allows us to do a lot of really cool and interesting things. But the first concept that might be unintuitive that you have to get your head around is, unlike in the real world where you hand someone money and then they have that money, instead you hand, <laughs> you declare an intention to give your money to somebody, it disappears, and then in a, a new coin appears, in, which belongs to them. Um, you've got to wrap your head around this because that's how it works. But because it disappears and you tell it what to do, you can do fun things like instantly generating change for yourself, uh, splitting a 
uh, 10 Chia coin into 10 one Chia coins or uh, 10 one Chia coins into a single 10. Um, and you can make multiple payments at once. One single coin can go to multiple different people and you can put smart programs inside of them. So with this disappearing, you can play a lot of cool tricks uh, with value and programs. So, if the coin just disappears, how do we know, how does the blockchain know what you want to happen? Uh, when you run the program inside of a coin, it returns a series of instructions to the blockchain that will um, basically describe what guarantees and actions you want it to take. Um, these are split into roughly two types of categories. The uh, If this is true, then go ahead. If this fails, then cancel. That'd be stuff like assert my ID or assert my amount, where you say, uh, dear blockchain, if if this isn't true, don't don't put this transaction through. And then you have stuff like create coin and create announcement, which I'll talk about later, which are saying, if all the other conditions have, are true, then do this. So create coin obviously makes a new coin. Uh, and these are what is returned when you run the program inside of a coin. And they let the blockchain know um, what to do. Any questions about this? Any questions so far? Nope. Great. Uh, <laughs> it ramps up quick, so if, if I do lose you, please shout. And those conditions are basically everything that you can do on the blockchain. So if you go, go back, one, one, the, like the last one is uh, assert height, which is basically wait for a block to be correct, or it's not correct after a block. So you can do timing things. And like the signature stuff, so you can allow only certain people or certain cryptographic keys to do stuff. And we're gonna go into that later. Um, but that's basically if everything you want to do, want the blockchain to do, and the conditions to enforce that is 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 puffed through that. Yeah, I go into this a little bit, but you have guarantees that are provided by the program and guarantees that are provided by the blockchain. Um, but foundationally, this is the guarantees that you can get provided by the blockchain. Uh, and so another piece here, I say a final piece, but this is the beginning of uh, the slides. Um, when you spend a coin or multiple coins, you create an object called a spend bundle. And this is a request to the farmers who uh, manage the blockchain. Those are the people that enforce uh, that the blocks stay secure. And this contains a list of coins that you want to spend, the reveal of the hash of the program inside of it, uh, some input uh, to the program, which is called the solution. Again, more on that later. And it is tied together with a cryptographic signature. So you have uh, the coin spend, which is coin uh, program reveal solution. You get a list of those, and then you get the signature, which ties the spend bundle together. The signature, strictly speaking, is optional, uh, but it's included. Um, and that's how you make a spend. So you make one of those. So to recap, the blockchain tracks coins. Coins contain programs. People spend their coins by sending off a spend bundle. Coins then run the program with the solution. If the spend is successful, that returns conditions, and then the blockchain updates which coins exist. And that's the, that's the, the life cycle of a coin. It's also worth keeping in mind, because uh, this is where a lot of cool stuff can happen in Chia, is the spend bundles don't need to be sent off immediately. You can um, serialize it into a file, into a text file, and send it around. People can modify the solution. Uh, we use this to create the offer files. If you've used Chia offer files, basically what that is is a spend bundle that people will send off that is secured by the signatures that exist, but also allows people to edit it. 
Uh, and you can do a lot of cool tricks about this. This, in my mind, this is one of the most exciting, like unexplored depths of uh, Chia development. So just keep this in mind. I'm not going to go too deep on it because we're still at the start, but uh, lot, lots, lots to think about there. Uh, now we have questions again. Sorry. Uh, with the spends, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've got like a, a cert height and whatever um, uh, 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 with the conditions. Are them only executed if you try and spend the kind? So um, what happens is uh, you can assess what is going to be returned. Um, so if you send off your spend bundle to a farmer, they can run that program really quickly and just see what's this going to do, where, how much money will I make uh, selfishly if I include this. And they will see the conditions. They will see it says, oh, oh this, this won't go through on the blockchain for 200 more blocks. And then they can just choose to not include it. Right. Um, because the, that, that transaction will get rejected and it's impossible to include. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. So, but yeah, you, you have to spend it in order to, to make a check. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't automatically get poked just because um, right. there's some timer in there. So that's something that, that is, for, for example, if you're experienced or you have some experience with other uh, blockchains like Ethereum or, or other blockchains like that, um, in that case, the contracts can do some things on their own for like, uh, but in, what, what in Chia happens is you always have to poke the coin. So right, uh, that, you have to spend it. Case, yeah, and I always uh, sometimes but, call that poking. <laughs> you have but, to poke a thing to um, make it do something. If the if one of these conditions fails, if the uh, assert height, um, if it's not that condition is not met, uh, then the coin is not spent. It doesn't disappear. Yeah. It's still there on the blockchain, uh, waiting for a successful spend <clears throat> to go through. If I create a completely fake coin. Yeah. How does it get authenticated? If you try and spend a coin that doesn't exist, um, no farmer will accept that because the blockchain contains the set of all coins that are real. So you can just compare it against. It'll say uh, uh, invalid coin ID. So, so the, you mentioned a solution, so the solution isn't used for that, right? The solution, I'll get into more about what the solution is, but basically, you can think of the program inside of the coin as like a function that returns conditions, and the solution is the arguments that get passed to that function. If that makes sense. I think it will start to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can't fake coins. Yeah. Uh, that's that's actually it quite depends on the, the conditions, right? <clears throat> because it's not in the in the chain. Yeah, there's actually a, a bunch of things that it checks without you uh, like specifying the conditions. One thing is, does this coin exist? One thing is, has this coin already been spent? So you cannot do a double spend. Uh, another condition is, is there more money cr created than there was before? Uh, so you cannot like create a, a value out of thin air. Um, so there was, like, it always has to balance out. And those are just a bunch of conditions that the blockchain enforces without you explicitly specifying those conditions. Um, because yeah, you, there's no way around it. You're not allowed to change the, those those aspects yeah you can't print money <laughs> you can but you have to destroy it in the same way <laughs> so the, 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 the actual program so you're showing us some instructions which were capitalized with underscores so a program would contain multiple lines of those instructions um so the program um we'll get into more about the what the body of a program looks like but it the, the point is that it returns, at the end, it evaluates to and returns a list of those conditions. Um, and we'll get into more about how it does that in a, uh, shortly. Everyone happy? Okay, fantastic.
So, uh, in chapter zero, we covered what Chia was, and now we're going to get more into the programs that control the coins. Um, so, Chia Lisp is the high level language that compiles down to CLVM. CLVM is what runs on the chain. You can think about it as like Java and Java bytecode, or like C compiling to assembly. It works like that. Um, the two commands that you're going to want to do throughout all of this are run a file name and pipe that into a hex file, and then run on the hex file. So I'm going to give an example, and I want everyone to run it on their laptops, and then because then if we get this sorted, then you can program along with me as I talk throughout the rest of this session. So to do a hello world, it's dead simple. So I want you to make a new file, use nano or vim or text edit, however you like to do it, and do parentheses mod, para parentheses, parentheses q dot hello world and then make this into a file and then I'll pull those other commands up on screen again run here is for the higher level language and brun is for the lower level uh, CLVM language but uh, um, so let's take a look at the anatomy of this CLISP program <laughs> You can see that for every parentheses, we have a matching parentheses. Mod here is the instruction to compile. Without mod, it's not going to compile. In here, this is where the solution would go, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But the way that this is working is the first entry in a list, unless it's quoted, is an instruction, like an operator, like an instruction to add or subtract or do something. So here it's saying to compile using this and this list and the start of this list is the instruction to quote which just means return to say. Then we have a dot which I'll get to a little bit and then we have the literal string hello world. So this is a list inside of the list which contains the instruction to compile and that's all you need to know for now. Yeah, and huh. just to, to, uh, to clarify, when we speak about solution, it's usually the input parameters. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, one thing it might be useful to have up on your computer in a new tab is um, cheerless.com. This is the official documentation. And in another tab, if you go to docs.chia.nut slash conditions, that's the full list of conditions I was talking about in the previous part, the conditions being what's returned to the blockchain uh, in order to give instructions. So just make sure you've got those up because they'll be useful for the whole rest of the day. Lisp is a special language in that really it's only got a few types. It has lists and it has atoms and lists can contain other lists and lists can contain atoms a list is actually a box of two things um, where those two things can be other boxes or atoms so a box is denoted with a period of a dot between the two entries and a list does not have a dot, it's just thing, space, thing, space, thing. You can see here that the list is a box with, where the thing on the right is another list with, a, uh, with another cons box where the thing on the right is another cons box terminating in null. Null is a special operator, it's equivalent to zero, false, um, empty list and null, it is all of those things. Um, as I mentioned before, operations are the first thing in a list, so in this list, x would be treated as an operator that operates on y and z. Um, some other examples are hash plus so on. 
this will become more intuitive. We don't tend to deal with cons boxes, but just think, just keep it in mind um, as we go forward. A list is really constructed out of these things. Um, you can also do uh, this is entirely loading things on the right. You could also have X be lists and cons boxes, but you, they're the atoms and the lists are basically the bread and butter here. Everything comes down into this. When you operate on a list, um, you have a few options. F means first. If you call first on this list, it will take off the first item from that list. So. Uh, you, you, can, you can type these on your computer now if you'd like to follow along. Rest will return everything except the first thing. Cons, which is C, will add something to the start of the list. So if you cons 100 to the list 200, 300, 400, you would get a list of 100, 200, 300, 400. And list is a command that will just create a list given what's inputted. And again, so these are your bread and butters. Uh, list is actually uh, on the lower level a version of cons, but don't worry about that for now. Just make sure you're comfortable with first, rest, cons, and list, because this is how you construct lists, and in Lisp, everything is lists. We got some maths operators plus minus times div mod which provides the uh, the dividend and the modulo uh, in the result and equals which is the equivalent of equals equals which is is this equal to rather than make it equal to Um, as we get more into types, uh, atoms, as I said, are the inherent uh, type. But what you'll find is that different operations will make assumptions about the type of an atom. So plus will treat everything as an integer. So if you add one to hello, using the ASCII table, that'll turn into help. If, you, if you're familiar with, uh, with ASCII, you'll understand why that is, but it's because Strings are numbers, numbers are numbers, everything is hex, it's all the same type. But um, equals uh, and if use Boolean of zero, which is, as you recall is the same as empty list, to be false, and everything else is true. Typically you'll see that as just one, but anything that is not zero um, is false. Uh, yes, yes, everything that is not zero is true. Um, uh, many operators will, ex will only accept atoms and not lists, and will fail if you pass them a list. Um, and there's a few prefixes for types here. You can do a 0x prefix uh, on a, your atom, and it will be a hex string. If you use quotation marks, that indicates a literal <laughs> string, and integers tend to be interpreted as integers. Any questions about that? Cool. So is every is, is so underneath atoms everything's is basically bytes. Yeah, everything everything is bytes. Everything is hex. Everything is everything. It just it kind of depends on what's interpreting it. Is the is the point of this slide? Sure. Now we get into something a bit more complicated: control flow and the solution. So that previously empty list after mod is actually where we put uh, names for the things that get passed into the solution. So for now, we're just going to call them value one, value two, and value three. And this puts a name to them. As I said before, you can think of this as a function. And these are the arguments to the function. Um, you can put. Uh, they don't have to be strictly a list, you can put cons boxes or whatever, but as you write it here, this is the, the format that the program will expect. Next, we have the if. Now, uh, you're pretty familiar with if probably, where if statement 
then do otherwise. Um, well, if A, do B, else do C. Um, so the equals command, as I said, this is, um, is equivalent to equals equals, where it's going to check the value of the value one and value two. And if those two are equal, then we're going to return value three. Otherwise, we're going to do x. Now, x is, is another special operator, like q, in that it instantly fails. If at any time during runtime, you see uh, the, the runtime evaluates the x command, it will fail, transaction will not go through, that means it's invalid. So I think it's probably worth pausing for you guys to uh, run this because it's going to get more complicated from here. As I talked about in part zero, for those who weren't there, what you need to remember is these programs live inside coins. When you spend a coin, you run the program and the coin disappears. Um, I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but that's okay. So when you write a code, when you write a cheerless program, you need to write it with the perspective. You need to imagine that you are a coin and you say, what do I need to guarantee? What do I need to protect? And so you, you, you think to yourself, the program should say something like, if it's been two weeks, then I can be spent. I can be, I must only allow spends to the following types of addresses. And this sounds a bit woo woo or crazy, but I genuinely do this all the time. And that's how you need to think about this stuff. Um, when do cheerless programs fail? So again, a little bit of repeating myself here, but it's, it's good to think about. So a cheerless program can fail if it gets an unexpected type or the solution isn't formatted correctly and it tries to do something that it can't do. It will fail and the spend won't go through. A cheerless program can also fail if X gets called. So for example, you might say, uh, this coin has a password in, and if you put in the wrong password to the solution, then X gets called, the spend doesn't go through. A cheerless program can fail if the returned conditions do not pass. Now I might have to go over conditions again for the people who are late, but remember, uh, people who were here before, that a cheerless program is returning a set of instructions to the blockchain called conditions that the blockchain will then evaluate. And if those are wrong, it doesn't matter if the program ran successfully, the transaction still won't go through. Um, so it really has a number of checks, including, as Andrea said, some extra ones that I haven't written here. But as you write, the cheer list, you've got to be thinking roughly about where it can fail and when it should be failing and when it shouldn't be failing. Uh, because that is the security and we're dealing with money. So security is like priority number one. So, uh, going over conditions again, this is the expected format. When you run this program, it's running in the context of the blockchain that expects the program to return conditions that it understands. Now, if you loaded up the list of conditions website on docs.chia.net slash conditions, you'll see that they really map to numbers. So condition 51 is for creating a coin. This lets the blockchain know that you want to create a coin if this spends a success. Uh, the number 72 is for asserting my puzzle hash. So at this point, uh, you should be for, you should realize what this all this is doing is creating a list. Oh, I forgot. I should be saying list there. <laughs> um, creating a list of create coin my puzzle hash amount, and then pretend that says list list seventy two of my puzzle hash. And so that is a list of conditions, which are themselves the lists that the blockchain can then evaluate. Um, if you're a little confused about this because you've showed up late, I can, we can talk you through it a bit later. Uh, in this program, you can't use Q because you want my puzzle hash to be evaluated in, as to what it was in the solution. Are there any questions so far with, we've got a coin that's returning conditions 
and the conditions are evaluated by the blockchain. Is 51 and create coin interchangeable? Like you can use create coin instead of 51 instead of, instead of code? So we have a standard library that will map, um, okay. so you can do include condition codes and then that'll just map the English create coin 251. Um, but no, you, if you don't do that, you have to do 51. You'll see that we do start including that um, pretty soon, and you'll be able to do that. Um, but, but yeah, that's a library that we have that maps the English language names. Can I ask something? Yeah. Why do we need to add this there? Earlier, I think you mentioned that the parentheses, the parentheses mm -hmm. themselves, just create a list, right? The, so why do we need to, you know, you just because um, remember I said the first thing in a list is is, is treated as the operation. So here, uh, and these programs run sort of inside out. So this is going to, the first thing that's going to run is this, and it's going to say, make a list of 51 my puzzle hash amount. And then using the result of that is passed in uh, to this command, which says make a list. But here, we're not using the command to make a list. So it's going to try and run 72 as if it was an operation. And that is the fateful bug I put in here. Um, because the first thing in a list is treated as an operation, and these programs they run um, inside out. Sorry, why do you have to put numeric constants in? Why isn't it aware of the actual string? Couldn't it be more readable? Well, that's why I was saying we have a, a library that you can include that will map the strings to the numbers, but it's uh, because space on the blockchain is a premium, the string create coin is several times larger than a small integer. And you want to really make sure these are compressed because in a very literal sense, you pay for space on the blockchain. So we want these programs to be as compressed as possible. Also remember that we have, in Chia, we have around 100,000 full nodes. So 100,000 computers all over the world that store the whole history of the blockchain. So if you store a string that is 10 times larger than it should, it could be, then it's like times 100,000 and that's, that's also why the operation names like F and R are so short. Yeah. It's because we just want to minimize the, the, the space. But So that would be perhaps for deployment, but if you're doing development, could you, yeah. Yeah, that's and that, that's why we have the library that maps yeah. those. Um, quick question. In this case, what would happen if you just miss the asset my puzzle hash condition? So um, if, if what do you mean? If you, if you don't have this condition at all, you have only the 51. Oh, so that would that would work. Um, this, this is, oh, I missed this line here. This example program is a coin that just recreates itself. So we want to, we want to guarantee that um, it, it's recreating itself using the same puzzle. So when you pass in, I'll get into more into guarantees in a bit, but you pass in my puzzle hash, but the, program itself doesn't know where it's running. So it relies externally on the blockchain to check that this thing is my puzzle hash. And the blockchain verifies that as one of these conditions that I talked about. If such and such is true, then do something. So if my puzzle hash is the coin's puzzle hash, then create coin of puzzle hash amount. Um, and there are a bunch of those assert my uh, conditions, like this is my puzzle hash, my amount, my parent, a bunch of those. And there's a reason why those are needed. It's mainly because the coin itself or the, the puzzle itself doesn't have any state. So it can you, anything that it wants to know about the outside world, like what happened on the blockchain before, or things like that, or what I am, in which coin I live, is has to be passed in through the, 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 the solution. So, through the inputs, but this is an attack vector because if you if the coin itself doesn't check that this is the right thing, or if the blockchain doesn't check that, um, then you could pass in a different amount, like less than the coin is worth, and then you can steal the rest. So the coin, the code itself doesn't know anything about the outside world, so it has to be passed in, and to make sure that those guarantees are actually true. Uh, the blockchain can enforce that with those assert my conditions. And in this case, there's actually a security hole because there's no assert my amount, which means 
if somebody creates this puzzle in a coin which is a which large amount. Yeah, I was, I was going to get into the loosey goosey amount stuff. Okay. Um, but the, the point, this goes back to the previous slide where you want to think about what uh, guarantees the program is providing. And here it's, it's guaranteeing that it will make the same puzzle hash in the next coin. Um, so what you can think about this on the scale of the blockchain is the coin will create another coin with the same program, will create another coin with the same program. But as Andreas points out, the amount is not secured, so the amount of that coin can go up or down, but the puzzle will stay the same. Because as I mentioned in the previous chapter, a coin is its origin, its puzzle, and its amount. So here we're letting the amount change while enforcing that the puzzle stays the same. And the funny thing is, if, the, if there is a, a value left on the table, so let's say a, a coin recreates new coins, but the amount of the new coins doesn't add up to the original amount, then there's something left on the table and anybody on the blockchain can now come and grab that amount. Most likely the farmer, so the one that builds the block, will look for any amount of value that is not reused and will grab that. So yeah, there's, there's a, a games you can play with amounts that will get a bit into that more. Next up is defining functions. And this is, I hope all of you have used recursion before because otherwise I'm about to break some brains. Um, <laughs> recursion is a function that's defined in terms of itself. Uh, what this means is here we define the function as square, uh, define it with the name square, and inside of this we call the function that we've just written. Uh, if, any, if any of you haven't done this, I'm sorry. Um, so what we do here is, if we don't look at the function, we're, we're passing in a list, and then we're calling the function on the list. The function looks a little bit like mod, but we give it a name. So it's defun, function name, and then a list, which is the arguments list, a lot like this is the arguments list for the whole program. So you can put multiple things here, but for now we're just putting one. So then we call cons on something from the first. So we take the first, uh, you've also probably noticed that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you evaluate inside the list, then outside the list. Um, you can think of it like nested statements inside of the programming languages, but Lisp has to work like this, everything works like this. So um, here, we'll start from the inside. Multiply the first thing from the list with the first thing from the list, squaring things. And then cons that, so add the result of this onto the result of this. Now this calls the same function on the rest of the numbers. Um, but the thing is, because we call rest, and because a empty list is the same as false, eventually that list will be empty, at which point when we call if on the list, there'll be nothing left, which will evaluate to false, so it will return an empty list, and uh, then all of the conses will get added, because as we go back up, it's going to cons this onto this, and return that to the layer above, cons this onto this, return to the layer above, and at the end you get a full list. Any questions? Okay, why it might sorry, be- Why does it need the empty list? Because um, you, when you con something onto something, you can think about it as you have to have um, a list, an empty list. So are you talking about this one? Yeah. So um, they, this just lets it know to add to something. You can say it's like um, cons will always expect two values. Okay. So you can think about it as like, if we had the add operation required two values, you'd want to put zero there at the bottom, right? Um, but cons works the same way, but with a list. So you put an empty list in. So you con something onto the empty list, and then you get a list with one thing in it. And then you con something onto that, you get a list with two things so in like it. So like the first bit of it. Yeah, yeah, so this is like, 
you can, can think of this as once you've once you've looped through this list, at the at the very bottom, you just want to return an empty list. Uh, okay, so maybe. Um, I think we don't have to do that because the yeah. we have a similar example. Uh, Sorry, F removes the first element every time. No, it doesn't remove it. It just returns it. So it, it doesn't mutate the list. It just gives you the first element. It's like a lookup. The yes. F, yeah, F doesn't actually change what remaining numbers is. This just it. Think about it as yeah. like looking into an array. The, okay, yeah, if that's the case, where we use R for the rest of the numbers. Mm -hmm. All right. So the rest is uh, what? Okay. So what it goes to the, what, why would it go to the second number when it? goes to that line, like square R so, remaining numbers, so this it just will call calls itself again, and it will go to F. Why won't it square the first number again? Because R of remaining numbers, let's say we have a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, oh, yeah, 5. Correct, 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 correct. And F, the first time we call this function, first we, call. we have remaining numbers is the list of 5. Yeah. And F will return 1, and R will return 2, 3, 4, 5. So oh. Cool. Okay. And, yeah, and, that's and then we call perfect, square, perfect, yeah. and yes. f will be two, thanks. and r will be three, four, five. Great, great, thanks. And eventually, there's nothing left. The if um, will see zero, and then we go back up. So, this is quite a jump in uh, conceptual requirement. So. Um, We've got some tasks for you to do here. We're going to take another little doing things break. Um, can you make a coin which sends itself to a puzzle hash passed into the solution? Can you make it generate accurate change using assert my amount? So you'll have to look up what assert my amount is and do, do some maths. And can you make a function which is passed in a list of puzzle hashes and does a create coin of amount one for every puzzle hash in the list and then generates change with what's left. So, so what, the three tasks, so you can start with the first one. Yeah, they get these, <laughs> these, 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 in, these increase in difficulty. So start with one, then do two, then do three. Uh, and that's, that's going to be your exercise to start writing some cheer lists that would work on the blockchain. And before you, can, before you do that, you can grab yourself a copy. Yeah, so this is, this is like a word right now. All right. Thanks, everyone. All the coins that we've made so far have been able to be spent by anybody. There's been no protection. You pass in the solution, and it runs. So, in order, in order for us to have coins, they need to belong to us. So how do we do that? Before we get onto that, we want to get onto the puzzle hashes. And uh, we've been talking about the puzzle hash, uh, but we have not really dived into how that's constructed. So we already looked at include, because we were including the conditions code library. Uh, with, that is a really standard one. Another super common one is SHA-256 tree, which will allow us to take hash trees. Uh, if you're familiar with blockchains, you've probably seen uh, Merkle roots before. This is where you take the hash of the leaves of a tree, and then hash the leaf against the leaf, and then do the same on this side, leaf hashed with leaf, so you get the hash of the leaf, the hash of the leaf, the hash of those two things together, hash of these two things to concatenated, and then eventually you get this. If you've if you think about Lisp programs, you can really model them as trees, where we already saw we're evaluating from the inside, and then at, the, at some point you get an atom, and so you can evaluate a whole Lisp program as if it were a tree to make a single hash. We do this, um, normally you can hash atoms together, so the hash of hello space world is the same as the hash of hello space world. Uh, but what you can't do is the hash of a list. As I mentioned before, a lot of things only expect atoms. 
So given that a typical cheer list program is a list of lists, what we need to do is use that Merkle tree. Um, and we do this by um, prepending, you can see it calls the hash of the hash tree of the first thing. So it does this recursive technique that we just looked at to hash the whole program. So that's how you get the puzzle hash. That's what that is. Um, next up, signatures. Now, as you saw, if you managed to spend, the uh, coin spend bundle has a signature attached. Um, hopefully, you people have experience with uh, signatures and some basic cryptography. Uh, does anyone put their hand up if they have no experience with public and private keys? Okay, everyone's got a little bit of experience, that's good. Um, so, just to recap, uh, you have the public key, which the world knows about, and the private key, which makes signatures which get verified against the public key. We have a condition called agsig unsafe, which means uh, it will check that the spend bundle, the coin spend that you've sent off in, it'll look into the signature and say the transaction is only valid if the signature of a message from the private key associated with the pub key is present in the spend bundle. When you make a spend, it's got a signature, you can return a condition that checks things in the signature. We use BLS to allow signatures to be aggregated. So instead of one signature per uh, coin or per, you know, instead of having to have a list of them, we use BLS to, so that you can add signatures together, so you can have a lot of signatures inside one signature, which is why you have a list of coin spends but only one signature, because that signature is actually the aggregation of a lot of signatures, potentially. We also typically have a more safe version of, of AgSig because um, you get this thing called replay attacks where if a coin is secured by saying there must be a signature um, from this pub key of this message, if that's if you ask for that again, someone can look at on the blockchain, see that signature already exists, and reuse it. So what we tend to do is use Agsig me and say the signature must also include this coin's ID, um, and that means that that signature is only valid for that coin and this prevents replay attacks. The coin ID is simply the hash of the three things that make it up. We uh, have touched on this a little bit, parent ID, puzzle hash amount. So the, the SHA-256 of those is what makes a coin ID. So it's message plus coin ID, um, and that gives you the aggregated signature me message. We can now start to think about making a coin that is owned by a pub key, and the pub key sort of represents your ownership. Think about the trade files where we said that people can disrupt um, the target puzzle hash. So if, if someone sees a spend bundle on the chain, if a farmer sees a spend bundle, they can edit it. So can anyone tell me what's wrong with this example? because previously we've been saying just put in the target puzzle hash. The, the farmer can just choose another target puzzle hash. Exactly. Because these conditions are not secured, we were talking before about securing things like my amount by asserting it, but target puzzle hash here is not secured at all. Someone could change the solution and, re and resubmit that transaction to their own puzzle hash and that is a huge security problem. So what we want to do a signature from the pub key of the target, and that means that you, who owns the pub key, have authorized this. Now, uh, now we go back to currying, because you'll see that this is in the solution, but it's, we've kind of written it in all capitals, So, 
here we have a, solu a, a solution defined with three values, value one, value two, value three. Currying is a, a mathematical technique that takes a function which has a certain number of arguments and it sort of um, fixes one of those or more to be constant values. So if we curried the first value in this solution, it would return effectively, if we put 100 in to value one, it would effectively give us a program that looks like this, where it only takes two values as input and 100 has been fixed. So where it was referencing value one, we've curried in 100. And so we can do this um, with multiple values, but we use this to make blueprints, right? So we can think of this as the blueprint for checking value two equals something, but if we curry it, then it becomes a constant like this. And when we put this on the chain, it just sees equals 100 value two. So it's really allows you to sort of make blueprints of the type of thing that you'll put onto the chain. So value one becomes fixed to a constant and we can then change it. Uh, any questions about currying? Because this is quite complex. Where do I start? <laughs> uh, so it's basically like in, in, the, in the other programming yeah. languages, is, is it somehow like where you're defining a function and the parameter is, has already a value set in it, something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, so if you program, in other programming languages, you often have, maybe you have a constructor that has like one that takes three parameters and one that only takes one and predefines the other two. That's very similar, where you have a function that, that has different, the same name, but different uh, number of parameters. One, some of those are set to defaults. So that's very similar. Um, in this case, you just, but in this case, you get new a new code file basically. So you take a code file that has a va variables, and you predefine a bunch of those, and then uh, a new code falls out, and it's still not um, executed to, to to the end basically. You you just pre-execute. Fill it. Anyone, then, anyone else? I know, I know, I know you all ain't following this. <laughs> so it's, it's like I'm trying to understand the, the value of that. So we say it's a blueprint. So yeah. What does we mean blueprint? So let uh, maybe if I go Blue. back to the uh, the, the stuff with pub keys, yeah. yeah, it will kind of come together. So here you can see that we've uh, curried in the public key. So now All right. we have the generic form of what might secure a puzzle, but you, b before you like host that, before you uh, create a coin with this in, you'd curry in your public key, and now you have something that is entirely secured to your public key, but you don't have to like specifically do like a quote dot my public key. You just fill in this slot that you've written does that, make, does that put it into context a bit more for you? Just yes. You could send this thing on chain, but then everybody could put in their own public key, which is obviously not what we want to achieve here. So it's it's very much very much that you you prefill a value so you can this code everybody can use this code. That's a very good thing because then you can share it around and it's very easy to to operate with it. But you want, don't want this code on chain. You want to prefill some values and make them unchangeable. And that's what covering does. So you prefill things, and this convention by using all uppercase, that's something that we, um, or the cheer community um, settled on to just... Um, it, it, it indicates that this is not going to be part of the solution, like the lowercase values. This indicates that you should curry into this slot before you put it onto the blockchain. So that's a convention, so every time yes. this... Okay, that's you don't have to do that. So it can still be lower, so yes. it still works. Yes. Yeah. You, you, and you could curry further. You could curry in the target puzzle hash and make that a constant. But what you want to think about is, what do I want to be decided at runtime, or what do I want to be secured before this is like put onto the blockchain? Yeah. 
um, because here, this coin will exist for a, a long time, but then when you spend it, you will say, okay, as long as I sign the, the target, then it's fine, I can put anything here. So I can decide to send, I can own this coin, and then when I spend it, I decide I'm gonna send it to you, you, or you. Um, so it's kind of like a token replacement before you commit to a chain, is that it, sort of thing? You, you, before you put it on the chain, you commit to your public key. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you say, this other stuff doesn't matter as long as I sign it right, by the right. thing that's securing it. Yeah. So uh, when I was going around with people, I was talking about making sure values are secured. So here, my amount is secured by an assertion, and here, target puzzle hash is secured by my public key. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's, it's kind of, it's at the point that you're publishing it onto the chain that you're hard coding that value in. Yeah. Exactly. So after that, you can't. Exactly. Exactly. Code. Exactly. You and and so you want to hard code in your pub key, but you don't want to hard code in the stuff that's in the lowercase there because you want to decide that when you choose to spend. Yeah. And if you remember, the spend coin command accepted a solution, but if you carry it, put it on chain, and then spend it, you only provide two arguments because the other one isn't existing anymore. It's it's gone. It's, it's been plugged it's, up. Yeah. So the solution will only have two arguments. Mm. Yeah. The other one has been removed. It has been hard coded. There's nothing nothing there. So here this is a bit more flexible because we can decide what the target is when we spend it. But really what we want to do is make it very flexible. We want to choose entirely what happens. And so we can, what we can do is say, um, pass in a list of conditions, and then as long as a signature exists of those conditions, I can say from my public key of those conditions, just return the conditions. And that is completely flexible because you can decide when you spend it exactly how many create coins you want, how many other assertions you want, if you want to make announcements or, or anything else, this is completely flexible and um, it's completely secured by your public key. This isn't exactly what we use for the standard transaction um, for money in your wallet, but we're getting very close to it here because you can do whatever you like with it and it's all secured by your public key. So this is just saying, I don't care what you pass in as long as you sign it. Exactly. And then it will return so it would return conditions, but it comes as on uh, an axig me. So it's it's really minimal. It gives you a lot of power, and it just ensures that it's all secured by the public key. So yeah, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I'm imagining people will, will want to go back and look over the slides. Um, we're gonna break for lunch now, uh, but during lunch, um, we've got some more uh, tasks for you to play with. You can also go back on some of the other stuff if you were stuck before moving on. But this is gonna be a kind of a longer break while we eat. Um, I'm gonna leave these tasks up. Feel free to ask me and Andreas if you have any questions about what I've just talked about. But uh, let's break for lunch. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me yet, my name is Nick. Um, I've been around the Chia ecosystem for, I guess, since before mainnet launch. Um, and the latest thing I've been been working on um, is, is Circuit, the, the DeFi protocol for, for Chia. Um, I've actually teamed up with Seb for this, which I think a lot of you might know from his time at Chia Network. Um, so Seb was sort of, I think, working on the wallet there and a bunch of the other things, the infrastructure. And um, yeah, so it's the two of us working on this. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of, of what Circuit is. Um, so this is pretty much a non-technical talk so to ease us back into the afternoon session. So you can still you know, lean back, relax. Um, it's going to be an easy one. So in just a few words, so ByteCash is basically the, the stable coin of uh, the Circuit protocol. Um, so it's meant to be um, pegged 1-1 to the US dollar. 
Um, it's a standard Chia ASA token. Um, it's backed by uh, XCH as collateral. Um, we'll talk a bit about what that means in a minute. And um, it's also minted ad hoc by the protocol. So that means ByteCash is not generated somewhere outside the protocol and then supplied into it, as you may have, may have seen with some of these lending protocols. So it's, re it's really just generated by the, by the protocol itself. Um, so let's, let's see how it works. Um, or maybe I should ask first, is, is any one of you familiar with stablecoin protocols and other blockchains? Have you come across something like this before? Um, anyone heard of MakerDAO? So what we are doing is, you can think of it as MakerDAO for Chia. So it's the same kind of um, principle. You lock up collateral in a smart contract and you uh, can mint uh, the stablecoin against it. So borrowing, very simple. A borrower can just be any user. Anyone can come along. It's a DeFi protocol, so it's permissionless. Um, it's it's um, non-custodial, so you you stay in control of your own of your um, XCH that you're supplying into the smart contract. So there's going to be vaults. You lock your XCH up in a vault, and then in return, the vault will allow you to basically mint a certain amount of um, byte cash against against that collateral. Um, So it's, it's a loan, effectively. So you are actually expected to repay it at some point. Um, and again, doing that is very simple. Um, again, it's permissionless. You, you take the byte cash, you repay it to the vault, and then the vault will unlock your XCH and you can withdraw it and you basically dissolve the whole, the whole position. Um, so sometimes these vaults with MakerDAO, for example, they're called collateralized debt, debt positions. So sort of, yeah. Just tells you there's some collateral which is backing this this um, this stablecoin debt. Um, maybe one important point here: so that the debt might actually be higher than the um, original amount that you borrowed. So it works like a loan when you go to a bank. Um, in that sense, so you you have a principal amount. So what you borrow here is basically the principal, um, and then over time, the longer the the debt remains outstanding. Um, the, the higher it gets um, according to a stability fee or kind of interest rate that we come to on the next slide. So um, just keep in mind that um, what you need to repay might not be the exact amount that you took out originally. Um, different for the XCH, obviously, what you get back there is, is exactly what you put in. Um, so keeping the peg. Stable coins, that's always a, the, the big question here, right? So ByteCash is not an actual dollar, it's, it's just a token. Um, so how can we make sure that the token stays, you know, ha keeps its value around $1 in the market? Um, and that's basically via the stability fee, which, which is sort of a, a fee that accrues over time, just like interest does on an, on an outstanding loan. Um, so, Concretely, how would we do that? So if, if ByteCash um, is trading in the market above, above one US dollar, um, then what you can do is you lower the fee, you make it more attractive for people to come in, uh, borrow more ByteCash, and basically you increase the supply of ByteCash, and then it's, you know, it's supply demand as with everything else. So that generally should bring down the, um, the ByteCash price towards the one dollar peg. And if it's trading below the peg, which to be honest is the, the case one generally needs to worry about a bit more with, with stable coins, um, in that case you can, you can um, increase the, um, the rate to encourage repayments um, and basically tighten the supply. Um, right, so that's one of the mechanisms. Um, the other, I guess the key thing actually, is that the collateral that's backing the outstanding, the outstanding loans um, always needs to be bigger than, than what's owed to the protocol, right? So that's basically this over collateralization feature that, that's baked in. So as long as, as, long as the collateral is, is quite a bit bigger than the outstanding debt, um, you can be reasonably certain that you know, you're able to redeem your byte cash for, um, for that amount. So there's no reason really why, why your outstanding uh, stable coin should be trading at, at, at below dollar peg. Um, so what can happen now, of course, is that the collateral value sort of goes down um, and you want to make sure that you don't end up or that the protocol uh, doesn't want to be in a situation where the, the collateral value is, is lower than the, the outstanding debt. 
Um, and for that, you use some um, liquidations. Um, so a liquidation is basically a process whereby the protocol effectively seizes the collateral and auctions it off, it, it off in the market for byte cash. So basically other market participants can come in and say, look, I'm going to repay the protocol if the borrower doesn't do it. Anyone can come in, offer this byte cash back to the protocol and basically bid on this collateral. Um, so, you know, generally that, that should be a process. If, if, if the over collateralization here is big enough, even if the market tanks relatively quickly and the borrower doesn't manage to repay on time, um, then generally, you know, unless the market drops so quickly um, that, it, that it, the collateral value <coughs> goes below the debt, you don't end up in a situation where, where you're under collateralized. So that's the whole kind of magic, I guess, that goes into these um, uh, stable coin protocols. Um, it, it's this liquidation mechanism, mechanism, and you kind of want, you want people out there watching this and you know, that are ready to come in um, and um, help the protocol recover any, any debt when a borrower doesn't do it. Um, Yeah, so actually here, uh, a slide on what, what a liquidation looks like concretely. Um, so quite a bit to take in, I guess. But if the scenario arises where the, where the collateral sinks below the liquidation threshold, um, anyone can come in. So in, in DeFi speak, a keeper is just anyone on the network um, who is able to perform certain actions on a, on a smart contract. Um, or on a smart coin in our case. So keepers can literally just be any one of you. Um, quite often these are professional sort of trading firms, market makers and so on that, that are active in the crypto space and they'll look for these opportunities because in the end, you know, there is some money to be made. Um, you're bidding in an auction on this collateral. So depending on how much competition there is, you know, you, you, might, you might be able to earn a, a sort of certain margin in, in that process. Um, so it's kind of a, it's an actual business model being a keeper, I guess. So what happens, let's say um, the, the, the uh, position, um, a vault is, is becoming insufficiently collateralized. Um, a keeper can trigger this liquidation auction at that point. And then a bidding process starts where each keeper um, can say how much XCH they would be willing to accept for, you know, for, or they want to, they want to get for a certain amount of debt um, they're repaying to the protocol. And um, on top comes the liquidation penalty, so that's just another incentive again for the borrower to really repay uh, their loan on time. Um, so, yeah, just, just sort of to, um, just a little financial incentive on top there. Um, and once that has happened, so keepers have done the bidding, there's a winning, a winning keeper, um, pays back the loan to the protocol. Um, the protocol pays out a certain amount of XCH. There's most likely some left um, that goes back to the borrower. So borrowers don't get completely screwed. Um, and uh, the liquidation penalty actually goes into a protocol treasury, um, which then will be used for other purposes. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, but it, it, for example, is used to pay out certain incentives to the keepers so that they can cover their transaction fees and so on. Um, and then the debt itself has been recovered so that, you know, the, the byte cash tokens, they get melted and the debt is extinguished and the vault basically ceases to exist. So that in a nutshell is sort of the, um, yeah, I guess that's the key mechanism actually, which ensures that um, the, the outstanding byte cash is always over collateralized. Um, and should give the market that confidence that, the, that it doesn't depeg. Um, and then there's actually a third kind of little feature um, which can help keep the peg, especially sort of from below, and that's um, a savings vault. So users will be able to well, buy byte cash in the open market, um, deposit it in the savings vault, and then the um, savings vault will basically tap into the protocol treasury. So anything which is sort of earned from borrowers, um, well, not, not everything, but a, a large chunk of that uh, will basically be passed on to savers. So there's kind of an incentive for people to just hoover up byte cash in the market, lock it up, earn a yield, um, and that also helps to support the, the pack from below. Um, 
Right. So what, what are potential use cases? Um, no different than any other stable coin. I think in, on Chia we are sort of in the peculiar situation right now that after Stably got caught up in this prime trust insolvency that there's actually no stable coin. Um, so there could be a whole bunch of use cases right now um, for something like ByteCash. Um, Hodlers, for example, let's say you're a farmer, you're farming some chia. Um, you can either sell the chia on the market, um, but that just leaves you with, with cash. And so if you want to, you know, if you want to hold on for the long term um, in the run up to the halving, for example, um, an alternative could be to borrow against your chia, take the byte cash, use that to pay your electricity costs, um, and that way you kind of main, you, you keep that exposure to the to the XCH token. Um, speculators might just want to access leverage directly on chain. So, a concrete example: you're long, you want to go long XCH, you lock up some XCH, you borrow byte cash against it and you sell it in the market for more chia, right? So basically your 100 chia, you can turn that into 150 or, or whatever, right? Um, again, it's a risky process, obviously. It's speculation, um, it comes with leverage, so you know there's no free money, but it's, it's just a way of, of, if you want to take that view, um, or anyone who wants to do that can, can use it that way. Um, earning yield on, on USD, so that's what I was just talking about, savings vault. Um, traders, it's a nice way, you know, getting leverage is one way, but alternatively you might want to just sell some chia directly on chain, get into a safer, lower volatility asset, so you don't have to go to an exchange anymore, you can do that on chain by simply selling chia for byte cash. Um, yeah, and then lastly, I guess, you know, it's, it's a stable coin, so Hopefully, we're going to see some adoption by merchants, consumers as well. So I think um, Andreas, there he is, just launched um, XCH Pay. Is that what it was called? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's potentially another use case for, for a stable coin um, right there. Yeah, and that's it. Last slide, actually. Um, so challenges and solutions. Um, it's sort of a larger smart contract system. Um, so there's a few things that we came across where, where you know, we had to think about how we, how we can solve these problems. So first of all, I guess, coin set model means you can only spend a coin once per block, right? So it's, it's different from something like Solidity or the EVM where you have state um, and you can sort of repeatedly call functions on a smart contract. In Chia, everything is a spend. So kind of makes it a bit tricky in terms of keep, keeping, for example, global parameters, right? Um, if you want to keep a counter somewhere that checks, uh, you know, what is the total outstanding debt, um, you know, what's the total amount of collateral. So if you want to put constraints around that, um, it's, it's a bit tricky to do. Luckily, there is a few ways you can, you can solve this. So identical spend aggregation already exists. Um, so what that is, is basically um, you can include a spend in several spend bundles. Um, so that basically allows multiple users to spend a coin at the same time. Um, I don't think deduplication is live yet, right? So you still have kind of, it still takes up multiple spends, kind of the, the block That's space. Gonna, if it's not out yet, it's going to launch soon. Yeah. The and singleton spend aggregation is in, in the broadest sense is still being developed. Right. Yeah, so fast forward, I guess, is sort of one step up. It's not an identical <laughs> spend anymore. The parent ID can change, but the puzzle hash and amount, I think, need to stay the same. Uh, the, I think it's just the puzzle hash. As long as the, the right. puzzle hash remains the same, then you, then we get that. And then the more complex one is, is singleton spend aggregation, right. and the puzzle hash is changing as well. So if that's the case, for example, then you know, if, you, if the amount can change, you can almost create a little um, sort of uh, counter via workaround, right? You could just have tiny amounts of mojos being your counter. And, and um, so that could, be, that could be a first way of, of doing that sort of thing, having some sort of global state via a simple counter as, as amount of mojos. Yeah, and then the full kind of thing is single spend aggregation. You can spend a single multi -time, multiple times in, 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 in one block with changing uh, state as well. So your carried in arguments can actually change between spends. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably still going to take a few, what are we talking, so weeks, full, months full, to... Full single spend aggregation, that'll be a couple of months at least. Yeah. Um, 
because yeah, you want you want that to be flexible without taking a huge toll on the farmers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess what once you have that, I think what comes into play is sort of uh, maximum extractable value. So the sort of games farmers have to kind of well, might potentially be able to, to earn some money by ordering transactions cleverly or execu uh, executing these spends in certain orders. So um, things will get a bit more involved and, and I guess it puts more pressure on yeah, exactly what, what you need in terms of hardware requirements for farmers to fully max that out. Um, and then I guess uh, another sort of uh, thing that's unique to, uh, or that's different to Ethereum and EVM based models is, is statelessness. Um, what does that mean? Um, there is no state on chain. I think we learned in the, in the morning session, uh, state is just hashed into the coins. So whenever you do a spend, you actually need to reveal the state um, and that goes onto the chain. So overall that makes uh, transacting on Shear a bit more expensive um, because every time you basically trigger a smart contract function comes with a spend and, and the, the state kind of ends up on chain. Um, so you want to make sure that you design your system in such a way that you don't, rev you don't have to reveal everything, but, but things are modularized into different coins and you can just spend certain coins at a time, um, only what you need basically, and everything else can stay hidden behind the hashes and doesn't need to get spent. Um, yeah, another, another thing you need to think about is, is um, how do you keep track of state? Um, because it's not there on the chain for you to see, you know, you may have to go back in the history and you know, if you want to know what, what a certain, what's hashed into a coin, you may have, to, you, you need to go back to the previous spend and look at what actually happened in that execution on chain. So you look at the puzzle reveal, you look at what solution was passed in, um, and you obviously might want to track it back um, to, you know, some launcher coin to make sure it's actually a, the, the type of coin you think it is, right? So you need to sort of uh, track the um, the provenance of it. Um, yeah, and uh, for that we're also building a state monitoring tool. Um, ideally, that's going to be usable in some sort of more general sense, not just specific to circuit. But yeah, I don't know. I do. Is there actually something sort of being built by by Chia for that, that in, a, in a more general sense? I mean, it's not maybe enterprise wallet service. That scales to good to actually. Good I mean, it's basically a wallet. The wallet is what. Yeah. Tracks the state of the blockchain for your specific use case. Right. So yeah, anything that solves the problem for other wallets is probably the same thing. Yeah, it's it's all it's all just wallets really, um, because like you say, it, uh, if your state is a chessboard, uh, you're gonna need something that understands the rule of chess. Right. Um, yes. So, because especially if you're optimizing, like you say, you look at the solution and it says move this chess piece here, the wallet's gonna need to understand what that means for the yes. entry. Uh, so you, um, yeah, I guess a lot of sort of dr dr driver code needs to, you need to load driver code into it specific for whatever smart contracts you wanna, or smart coins you wanna monitor. Um, so yeah, ideally we're thinking, ideally there's a way of generalizing that in some sort of way so that you can take this tool, you load your drivers into it, and then you can, you know, it works for a pretty broad class of we tried of smart to design coins. the NFT standard so that it was like that, where you really, it's sort of about just accessing state. So we, we right. reuse the NFT code in a few places because it's really just a singleton with state and rules about how, how and when you can update that state. So right. It's kind of a generic. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then I guess last point, um, GLISP and CLVM are relatively low level languages. Um, there is a new version coming out, modern GLISP. I think there's already some, it's already live, right? It's, it's been. Yeah, so you, uh, you can play with it right now, but it's gonna right. get an official release in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so yeah, we are already making use of some of that anyway. Um, and I think going forward, there'll be sort of pragmas at the beginning of each mod that similar to Solidity, it tells you at the beginning which compiler version was this designed for the smart contract, um, this module, and then you can, you can, yeah, you have got some higher level abstractions that you can use, makes, makes coding a bit easier um, and more intuitive, I guess. Um, you kind of abstract away the low level stuff uh, to some extent. And yeah, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, yeah, well, when, oh, that's, 
I thought you were going to ask when, when coin or when, when, when token, yeah. When um, that's coming as well. But yeah, first we, we're going we're gonna to try to get testnet out by the end of the year, actually, um, yeah. and then hopefully launch in Q1 next year. Um, so. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the treasury doesn't have to build up. So, you know, there's a bit of money, ideally, you, you want to have in there to incentivize keepers, right? Um, Uh, no, so it, it actually has to accumulate. So we won't be generating byte cash out of nowhere. All the byte cash in circulation will have to come from a loan via, via one of these vaults. Um, and yeah, it might just take a, take a while for the treasury to build up. So, um, and again, so the, the stability fees actually, they, they accrue, but they don't, they're not payable on, it's not like a, like a loan where every, you know, every month you have to pay your interest. So it all accrues and only when, once a loan is repaid then, is that, then, then uh, do the stability fees get, get actually so charged? Like, uh, you don't kind of put savings in six months, you know, it's going to only last just forever until you. Yeah, time. yeah, exactly. And correct, correct. Um, yeah, so it might, it might take a while for, for the treasury to build up, um, indeed. Um, is there going to be an, an off ramp for byte cash? Like I, I, I'm a farmer, I have XCH and I need real dollar to buy whatever. Yeah, good, uh, good question. So we, we'll try obviously to, um, to put something in place, get, get this listed on an exchange. Um, but yeah, I think there is a chance in the beginning. You may have to ironically sell it for cheer and then cash out the cheer into dollar. So <laughs> that's probably how it's gonna go in the beginning. But yeah, we, we're having some conversations. We're trying to get some on and off runs for it as well. But uh, yeah, it's been hard enough for cheer, I think. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do there. Maybe, maybe Andreas can There's help as well. There's a different incentive for you than, than for cheer. So, because you, you, there's, there's fees there. There's, so for you, there's a real incentive. That, that, that's a business model. Yeah, um, yeah, but I guess same for Chia. I mean, they're, they're sitting on a big pre-farm, so yeah, I think, let, let's see. I, think, let, 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 I mean, this is gonna start a lot smaller. I think we're not gonna be able to offer exchanges Maybe money to list us. So we'll have, to, we'll have to see how this plays out, um, but yeah. Um, so the, the plan is that this is like the official stable coin for Chia, or? Uh, no, I mean, there's nothing official about it. I mean, it's, it's uh, I guess with, with sort of stable coins, right? There's big network effects. I don't think it makes sense to have, you know, five stable coins that all do the same thing. And so this one is a different, obviously, to something that's off-chain collateralized. So stably, um, stable coin, for example, is a, is a different beast, if you like. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're trying to, to, you know, we'll try to make it usable for people and then we'll just see if, you know, if, if, if it catches on. And um, I think usually with stable coins, the, net, the network effects are strong enough that it's difficult for other people doing the same thing. Um, so uh, when you say that it taps into the protocol, it taps into the protocol for exchanging Chia for bike cash and, and the whole lending protocol rather than Chia Chia protocol, right? Yeah, so this is built on top, exactly. So we, you know, it's, it's just something that built on top of the blockchain. It's not, um, you know, there's no direct relationship with Chia in any way, if you like. Um, so. I think the, it, the interesting thing is that it's not just a stable coin, it's also a lending protocol. So it offers you something different compared to some other stable coin that's just off-chain collateralized. I mean, the, what the, the off-chain stable coin allows you is to unwrap. So you could take dollars, put them, or send them at bank account and get tokens back. That's an on-ramp, but it doesn't give you any 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 lending mechanism. Whereas this gives you uh, the way to use your XCH without spending it, which might be interesting if you want to keep it, but it doesn't give you any, um, any on-ramp capability. So you have to stay on-chain. So it's just different problems mm -hmm. to solve, so to speak. And um, 
I mean, multiple stable coins is always interesting because it can also crash. So um, that's going to like, be a lot of fuss. So it's just make sure that it's always the same in value. And um, also, stable coins are just amazing because you can work on a blockchain with all the advantages that it brings with like fast confirmation and you can send huge amounts for like those little fees without having the exposure to the price um, going up and down um, that the native coins can have. So yeah, it's the different capabilities have different um, pros and cons. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, with with this you get there's leverage, right? Yeah. In it yeah. that you get which you can't get out of an off-chain collateralized stablecoin. Um, and I guess the risk profile is different as well. Here you have sort of, I guess, smart contract risk, whereas with stable you have this custody risk, for example. So, it, you know, different things to consider, and you know, depending on what your use case is, you might want to go for opt for one or the other. Yeah, no, I mean, it does. So um, it's, it's, it's a big concern for sure. I mean, you want to design your, your puzzles in such a way that they're efficient and small. Um, the puzzle reveals should be, should be relatively small, ideally. Um, that, you know, any, any sort of data you write to the blockchain is, is quite expensive. So are you kind of then, like in the, in the traditional finance world, you're sort of looking at some transaction like a bond, it's sort of cash flow dead easy, yeah. complex derivatives, So, I mean, generally, you want to have as much computation off-chain as you, as you can. Um, and really, what goes on-chain is, is only the result of the computation and then a simple way to verify it on-chain so that the com all the com you know, all computations all cost, um, cost as well, right, on-chain. So you, you want to outsource as much work, basically, to, to off-chain. Um, and yeah, I think with, with Chia, it's even more important than with something like um, e the EVM, um, w where you can carry some sort of state, right? Um, is, that, is that one of the changes in the modern Chia list, or is it sort of practical? No, I think that's a general design principle, right? So, you know, so what it means is your driver code becomes more complex because that's where the computations are done, and you design the puzzles so that all, all they do is verify the, the results, basically. All right, now I hear you all crying out <laughs> for more complexity. So <laughs> let's make it a little bit more difficult and get through some more of these slides. Uh, the questions that we'll be answering are, how do we have more complex on-chain programs? How do you make coins which last for more than one spend? And how do you store data and state long term? You all know what oracles are in, on, the, on blockchains. They basically, you can poll them and they'll say something and then you can trust what they say because they're oracles. So it's really easy to imagine something that looks like this where it will always recreate itself with the same amount and then it will just do something. It will say something that other coins can listen to. So this is very simple and it's actually like a step back. Um, so we can move forward from that. What if we want to recreate ourselves, but a bit different? So I touched on this as the final task before. It was like, you can make Chia Lisp inside Chia Lisp and then calculate hashes inside Chia Lisp. So you can end up making new puzzles inside Chia Lisp. Uh, and this can become a, a rabbit hole pretty quick, um, but you can see we, we were all just playing with currying and so what you can do is if you pass in the uncurried form, you can call curry on it, then call hash tree on it, and then it'll be in a create coin, and then you've made uh, something dynamically inside of your chia lisp. This works and it's pretty straightforward. You all understand that? The problem is 
that passing in the whole mod file is like revealing yourself twice. You're doubling the amount of information that you're putting on the chain because you're, you're doing the puzzle reveal and you're doing passing in the mod in the, in the solution. So, um, as we remember with tree hashes, we can actually do a little shortcut. Uh, we have this thing called curry and tree hash. Now, if you imagine the tree, the, what you can do is basically only have uh, one of the non-leaf nodes that contains the representation of everything underneath it, but you're only storing it like this. If you did a naive SHA-256 tree and used that, it would interpret it as an atom and not do that properly. But if we use the special version of curry and tree hash, which recognizes that this is actually represents a part of the code, then you only need to pass in the hash of the mod, and then you can then you can curry into the hash of the mod to get the puzzle hash of a curried puzzle. This is a little confusing, but when you see how it works in practice, it should make some sense. Let's say we have some state. This could be just some information, um, any information. Let's say it's the word hello. We've been using that as an example a lot. Then we have a pub key. And we can see that we're assigning the new state every time we spend. Um, but what we do to recreate ourselves here is um, we're passing in the hash of the, of the mod. This is the mod. Once you have this, then you can curry things into it. Uh, what you can do is hash this and pass that hash into itself. Everyone, <laughs> everyone following? Um, because just like how you added the pub key in, you can add an inf all the information about itself. It's like a digest. Uh, it's like if you uh, were to attach a checksum into a file or something. Um, so you, it just becomes another piece of data that you curry in. And then when you want to recreate yourself, well, you're currying the mod. So that's just what you were doing before. And you're passing in, in order, the mod hash again, the pub key again, and then whatever new state you want. And that will change the state because it's like recurring yourself. And this will create the new coin like dynamically. There's some bugs here. My amount's not checked, whatever. Uh, who cares? Um, but are you following that? Hmm. Put your hand up if you're not following that. <laughs> okay. A few people. Um, so... Basically, what we, did, what we did with currying on the command line, where you take a puzzle and stuff things in and get a new puzzle. In this case, it's the same thing, but it does it inside the puzzle. So you just take some information that it already knows about and uses that to curry things into a puzzle. And in order to have less work to do, we use this magic trick with the curry hashes. Curry hash is, the, is, the, is basically a shortcut, shortcut form of this where we were calling SHA tree on a curry, right? So this, will just this would produce the full puzzle and then this would turn it into the puzzle hash. And curry hash basically combines these operations. So it, it's currying and then hashing the result, uh, except it's using shortcuts inside of the uh, tree, the Merkle tree, in order to reduce the work. Um, the SHA-2561 stuff is to do with the implementation where, uh, as I said, atoms are prepended by um, one and lists are prepended by two. Um, don't worry about that too much. The point is that this coin is recreating itself and it's keeping these two things the same, but changing this. It's recreating itself, but different. Does that make more sense? Okay. Basically, just a way to 
affected the ash, the existing ash of your mud with the, the changes in argument, or in curried in argument? So ne you're nearly there. You don't change the mod because the mod is the uncurried form. That's the blueprint. And then the, when, you, when you put this on a create coin, you're going to curry these things in and then you'll get what we call like the final puzzle hash. But because it knows what its own blueprint is, it can refill that blueprint with different things. It, re it refills the first two values the same because it wants to keep those the same. But when it's refilling that third value in the blueprint, it's going to swap it out to something else. In, in another programming language, you might have classes and instances. So you have the blueprint is the class, and then you have one instance that is already in initiated. Mm -hmm. And this instance, you just pass in a new state, and then it creates a new instance, which leaves a lot of the things the same, but um, updates the, the one piece that you want to update. Now, with that oracle, um, one thing that's kind of surprising we haven't talked upon yet is this idea of spending in multiple ways because so far every coin has just had this like one constant output. But really, what you want to do with the coin, you might want it to be able to be do one thing sometimes and another thing sometimes. So um, we just give it different rules depending on the solution it gets. So here, we have an oracle where anybody can spend it in order to see what the state is, but then if you are the pub key owner, you can spend it to update the state. So here, we've, it's super simple. We have these things curried in, so, which are like the fixed into the blueprint, and then these things in the solution. And if we're passing in the new state, it's gonna see that and spend like this. And if it's not there, then we know it's just someone checking what the state is. And it's going to do this, where it's just going to uh, make an announcement of the state. We've not really got into the announcements. I can't remember if we do. Yes, we do. Hey! But it's basically a way of coins talking to each other. This means that someone else could make a, a coin that has some code that says, depending on the state coming from the oracle, do something. Uh, and so this will allow the creator to change it and a uh, general public to still spend this coin and see what the state is. Everyone following? So let's get a little bit more into how coins talk to each other. Uh, announcements are... Uh, uh, I'll tell you about how they were invented and that might um, <laughs> sort, sort of simplify it. Early on, before Chia uh, launched, one of the design patterns that came up is we kept wanting coins to pass information on, so they would make a coin with zero value that other coins would look at. And we realized this was very inefficient, because a lot of that time that would just get spent immediately. So what we did was we allowed these things that, when you create an announcement, it exists for the block that it's in, and it contains a message, and other coins can make an assertion of, of um, that message from another origin. So much like you could make an assertion of my amount or my uh, block height, you can make an assertion that another coin is saying something. And then it's not like a case of the one coin listens, it's that the one coin is told in the solution and then confirms, uh, because that's how we design everything in Cheerlisp. Everyone following? Uh, you get two types of announcements. You get coin announcements, which are based on the coin ID, and puzzle announcements, which are based on the puzzle hash. And this basically means, you can think of it as, uh, I want one specific coin to be telling me this, or I want anybody with this puzzle to be telling me this, and if that if somebody with that puzzle is telling me this, then it's true, or if someone with this coin ID is telling me this, then it's true. So you can use that with oracles to say, I want uh, either this specific instance of the oracle or anyone with the oracle puzzle to tell me this, and then I know it's true. And then we've got... Just a quick question. Um, how do you generate this puzzle announcement? 
It's a, it's a condition in the conditions. So in the same way that you would call create coin, you could call, uh, you could, I say call, that's not right. Return the condition create coin. You can return the condition create puzzle announcement. Um, and then that puzzle announcement will be created inside of the block that that coin exists in. So if you've made a spend bundle um, with a bunch of coins in, typically the design pattern you'd see is one coin would make an announcement confirming some thing in your application. And then the other coins would see this and assert it to be true. And then they could do something based on the information that this coin has said to be true. It's usually a, a method to link coins together so they cannot be separated again. Because some use cases, you, you spend one coin which provides the value and you have some other coin that does something with it. And in this case, you want to link them together. Otherwise, somebody will just rip them apart and say, I'm going to take that amount and do something else with it and leave out this, this other transaction. Because that's what farmers can do if you're not linking coins together. Uh, it's because it's a, it's a trustless system. Uh, you have to uh, really specify what's, what you actually want to do and what you want the guarantees you want to uh, link. So, so then, then the purpose is to actually announce based on some input. Like I'm, I'm thinking, like now, if there's like, uh, would there would it be a coin to say what is the temperature in in the at the, at the location? Mm -hmm. So the input would be the location, and it would return the kind of temperature, is it something like this. Or? Uh, that would be that would be an example of an oracle, like we've talked about, where um, let's say we have uh, this coin again. And let's say that this is a weather station oracle. Right. And maybe the BBC is reporting what the average temperature every day is. And so the BBC would be the pub key holders, and they'd update the state once a day to say the average temperature yesterday was six degrees Celsius. Uh, and then other, uh, other coins and other users would be able to spend this coin, which would immediately recreate itself, but it would, they'd be able to then say, oh, the BBC is telling us that it was six degrees Celsius yesterday. So you could make a coin that pays out if it is very cold. Or right, if yes. yesterday it was very cold, you can have a treasury that only pays out if yesterday right. it was very cold. And you have the oracle telling you how cold it is. And so you could only spend this thing if there is an announcement from this oracle okay. telling you that this so it is based on the announced, something being already announced rather than a response to an input, like saying, I, I don't say I, I want temperature like in London, it is basically there's a, a world map, for example, and being announced and I just, it's for me to pick up the, the location. Yeah, yes. yeah co coins, they, they don't like respond, you have to spend them. Um, so, right. so you make a spend and that announces that it's like six degrees or something. Mm -hmm. No, you would you would spend another coin at the same time yeah. uh, as that you spent this, yeah. and then, so then they they, they would be able to communicate because they were spent together because yeah. yeah. the announcements are yeah. temporary. The one practical example we had uh, earlier today, we did this trading thing with the authors. We have like a atomic swap between two parties, and this is basically also uh, protected by those announcements because you basically say, I am paying you this amount of XCH, but only if you are paying me this amount of tokens. And uh, that's basically protected by cross announcements. So my coin is checking for an announcement by somebody else who's telling me that they are paying me and they are not, uh, uh, listening to an announcement by myself that I'm paying them. And only if both sides are there and both connections and announcements are there, then this thing goes through. Otherwise, there's a missing part and it will not go through. So yeah, recreating yourself but different is uh, a huge, huge well of depth. Uh, the more you think about it, the deeper it gets. Um, so well, there is some good news. I know it's Friday afternoon, but a certain crypto millionaire is in fact doing a cheer giveaway. All you have to do is add your name to the list in the giveaway contract. I suppose you're adding some state to it. 
Uh, and unfortunately, the crypto millionaire did not finish his smart contract. So what we're going to need you to do is download the template. It's actually in the, in the GitHub workshop. Oh, it's, it's, it's in the GitHub workshop. But we're going to need you to download this, uh, this stub and then finish it. Uh, and then you'll be a crypto millionaire in no time. So let's, let's give that a crack. Just getting back to the idea of this coin. So what the idea was is we're going to create, a, so somebody like a crypto millionaire creates a giveaway coin. And this giveaway coin basically uh, contains a lot of Chia. So it's, it's as a coin with a very high Chia amount. And this coin has two ways it can be spent. One way is it can be spent by anyone and um, it gets a puzzle hash as the input and adds it to a list of puzzle hashes it stores inside. So what this means is anybody in the world is, is able to add themselves onto the list that is being tracked by the coin. And the second part is it can be paid out. Um, so I think we made it to be a payout height. So there's a blockchain height after which anybody can poke it to trigger the payout, which then pays out this huge amount of Chia um, equally to every puzzle hash in the list. So that's the idea. And uh, that's the code that achieves that. So and it contains a bunch of those things that, that Matt um, described before. First of all, it has two modes. So one is the payout mode. And the other one is the add myself to the list mode. And maybe we should start with the, with the, with the inputs of the mod itself. Um, so what it has, it has a payout height being carried in. So that's the uh, height at which it's going to be payout. And it has this list of puzzle hashes that it's going to store. And that's why it's carried in. And then it has the mode that you want to call, my amount because it's necessary and a puzzle hash to add. So this is the thing that uh, where, where users can put in their puzzle hash to be added. So we want to add this to that and recreate ourselves, or if the mode is one, then we want to pay out. So how do we do that? If you go all the way down, we're going to start with this case. This is the case where we add ourselves to the list and then recreate ourselves with this new list. And um, we already talked about that. This is this, it, it's this build puzzle hash function, which basically it does this carrying, uh, carrying. So it uses our own puzzle hash and carries in stuff. And it actually misses stuff because it misses this PR type. So it's not, uh, it's not correct here, but you can get the point. So um, it re recreates ourselves and this is the place where the puzzle hash list would go. And instead of using the puzzle hashes that we currently have, we add our own puzzle hash to this list using the C operator and use the result of this operation as our new list. So take the list that we currently have, put this puzzle hash to add into that list, get a new one, and then recreate ourselves with that list um, as the new one. So now we have a new coin with the same amount, with the same basic puzzle, the same blueprint, but now with a different list being tracked. So you can do that um, like per block. It can only be spent once, of course. 
Um, but that means that per block, there's one person in the world that is, being, uh, is, is able to add themselves to the list. And after a while, you're going to have a lot of entries in there, a lot of duplicates, because people want to participate multiple times. Of course they want. Um, so that's why <laughs> it's not the, the most secure code ever. But I, I think it, it um, yeah, shows the point. Yeah, it, sh it highlights what, what it's do doing. And after a certain amount, uh, after a certain block height, um, you want to claim this, and you want to claim it as soon as possible, of course, because otherwise more people will be added to the list, which reduces the payout to the existing ones. So you want people to, to trigger this payout. And the first condition the payout is going to return is a assert height absolute with this payout height, which means assert that this payout height has actually been reached, and the blockchain asserts that, if you wouldn't do that, um, then it could have it could be called immediately, um, and nobody would check that. So this makes sure that it's at some time in the future, um, this is going to be paid out. And then there is this thing uh, down here, which creates payout coins. And what does creating payout coins mean? It means you have a list of puzzle hashes, and for each puzzle hash in that list we want to create a coin because we want to pay out to each of them. And um, how do we gonna do that? We have a function called create payout coins and it takes the list of puzzle hashes and the amount that each uh, entry should get. And um, maybe we first move down here to see how we get the amount per entry. So how do we know how much each entry should get? Well, uh, we count the entries and then divide the total amount by the number of entries. So to do that, we first have to count the entries. And the count entries function was the first one uh, up here that was not uh, filled out. So how do you account, count, an entry, uh, count the entries in the list in, in a functional programming language? Um, well, you do a recursion. So you first count the number of entries in the rest of the list and then you add one for the current element. So you basically, you, you count one um, for the first element and then you call yourself, yourself again with the rest. And then you count one and call with the rest. And do that until you end up at the bottom of the list. List is empty, it's gonna return zero. And then you go up one, you say zero plus one, you go up one, one plus, three, uh, one, plus one, you go up two plus one, and you do that until you end up with the number of entries in the list. And that's basically a for loop. So that's how a for loop is gonna, uh, is, uh, for each is being done in, uh, in GLS or in functional programming languages in general. Um, it's also similar to a reduce. So maybe you've seen reduce functions in our programming languages, it's very similar. So you have a, you go down the list and every time you add something to the, um, to the accumulated value. So that's how you get the number of entries. Then you calculate the amount per entry, which is basically just dividing the total number um, by the number of shares. And in this case, we divide without looking at the rest um, and just take the, 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 like the whole amount. Um, so that's how we get the amount per entry. And then this final thing is to create a create coin condition for each puzzle hash, which is basically you create a coin condition for the first puzzle hash with this amount, and you can ignore that, and then you add this new condition to the payout coins of the rest of the puzzle hashes. So that's like the same principle that we had that we had with the counting the elements, but this time you add an element to list for every element in the list which ends up with a list of lists and that's just too many lists for one day. So I think we're gonna <laughs> leave it uh, to that. Um, but yeah, this would now create one create coin condition for every element in the puzzle hashes list. And you end up with a bunch of create coin conditions that would then pay out to everybody else. And that's how the giveaway works. Any questions? Uh -huh. uh, just the amount of 
mean question. Uh, so, I, I guess this is, this is how functional programming or this uh, particular thing works for principle. We, it seems to me that we are building the entire solution and at the end we add ourselves to it. Why don't we add ourselves to it from the beginning, at, along with the other things? You mean um, at the top where there is yeah. the puzzle hashes? Yeah, for example. Yeah. Because it's carried in. So on the blockchain, there's already a fixed value in the coin. Yeah. And you cannot, um, so the, the way this puzzle is created is um, it's already fixed. So the only way to modify it is to create a new coin. And I mean, what we could do is we could make it a variable and, uh, and tell people, okay, now please add yourselves to the list and then pass it into the uh, curry again or whatever. But the problem is you cannot control how people will m manipulate the list. So people could remove everybody else and keep only keep themselves inside, which is definitely not what we want to achieve. So in this case, we can control where, uh, we can exactly control how the list is manipulated. There's only one way the list is going to be manipulated and this is adding one value. So yeah, it's it's made it's it's restricting access to this. Um, yeah. As you get into um, deeper into Cheerless, you see patterns come up uh, on whether you're rewriting um, some conditions or some state, or you have add only to some conditions or some state, or you have filtering out of some conditions or some state. Uh, but for here we're having an add only uh, approach. So you're adding this to this and that's fixed to be the only thing that you can do when you spend it. Um, but you have a bunch of different patterns you could do for different security cases. You could do there at the end, uh, you could do a check to see if the puzzle hash to add is inside so you don't duplicate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could absolutely ex extend this to check for duplicates. And especially since, and that's uh, like an efficiency thing again, you already count entries here. So you could actually say, um, well, I'm just gonna ignore them in here. We're gonna go through the puzzle hashes anyway. So what we could do is maybe remember which puzzle hash we yeah, already seen it's like, it's like an and maybe ignore them. Um, it it up, might yeah. be more efficient to just do it at the end and not every time somebody adds something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Length. That just returns if it is a list or not. That it's not a length. It's not length. No. It just says, is the thing that I'm asking you about here a list or not? Uh, so that'll only ever return 0 or 1. If, um, if you want to pay out based on, say, like an external event, so what cryptocurrency is that, or <coughs> my parcel being delivered, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would you sort of paradigm wise, would you like have that in your contract that the parties involved would use their signature to say whether this has happened or not? Or would you have something like an oracle? Yeah, so this is a big problem across all blockchains is how do you get information that's not on the blockchain onto the blockchain? Uh, and there's a few there's a few solutions like you're touching on. You can have or trusted oracles. So the example we gave before with BBC Weather running an oracle, that'd be one thing. Uh, you could have signatures uh, like you're describing, and so, for example, like um, for package delivery, like the DPD delivery man and, and you could both sign and, and that go on the chain as the package has arrived. Um, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of solutions to that problem, but the problem of off-chain, onto-chain is, uh, is a real one. So with, with the Oracle one, so you've still got to poke it, like, look at the Oracle. You poke it. Yeah, you because you anyone can spend the oracle, so you just spend the oracle at the same time that you go. All right, this has happened. I I'm entitled to a payout. Right. Here's my proof from the oracle. Here's uh, me telling you to pay me. Right, right, okay. And, and then so so things like a counting element in the list. It, it seems so common. So are there are there no like uh, libraries to? There's loads of libraries. I was getting you to roll your own because it's good practice. <laughs> Also, there's another another thing you can do in, in here. It's actually 
a bit efficient, inefficient because you count the entries here, so you go through the list once, and then you go through the list here again, which is doing it twice and expensive on blockchains, whatever. Um, so what you can actually do is you can pass in the number of entries in the solution. So the person calling it has to tell you how long the list is. And you're just going to check when going through that list whether at the end uh, you end up with, um, with the length that you're expecting. And that way you can save this um, pass through and just like protect yourself against uh, cheaters anyway. So there's a lot of things that are usually like in a normal programming context, nobody cares about whether you do go through a list of 100 things once or twice. But in this case, it, it means higher fees. It means um, like... Um, yeah, if you like playing code golf, this is a great language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what you're telling is that if there's going to be inefficient CLS programmers, it's better for the farmers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so, so, so you mentioned that the cost increases as the complexity increases. So how is that calculated? Okay, so the cost has um, uh, a number of different aspects. One is the actual amount of bytes that you or your code um, uh, is, is long. So it count, just counts the length of the byte blob and for every byte you pay a certain fee or it has a certain cost. And then there's a cost attached to each operation. So you can see that in the documentation, each operation has a cost. And so for example, the, 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 the signature is very expensive. <clears throat> so you, you want to be efficient and not do multiple uh, signatures. The create coin, for example, is also very expensive. Um, but, al but also the operations like uh, C, has a cost, SHA-256 has a cost, um, but yeah, the, the condition, uh, return conditions as well have associated costs. But yeah, so that's this, the three things. The bytes itself, the operators of GLISP when executing, which is basically computing time, so to speak, and the conditions that are to be checked by the blockchain. Brun has a, an option to do dash C, and they'll tell you the cost of running um, which doesn't include the cost of the return conditions, but it'll tell you basically um, what the cost is. How efficient your code is. Yeah. So when, when you're playing code golf, you want to run dash C to get your score. Uh, how do you go to the security audit of uh, a smart code like that? Brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you get someone who knows what they're, what they're talking about, and they stare at it for three days and go, mm, fix this. And, uh, or you pay an external auditor. Um, but yeah, you basically get one of the other 20 people in the world who know what they're talking about uh, to cast an eye over it. Let me search it out. <laughs> yeah, I think we've doubled the number of chairs no. today. No, I kid, I kid. <laughs> but yeah. Um, if you look through the PowerPoint, we have included a bonus. We've kind of run out of time for it, but um, we were going to do something else. But uh, you've all you've all done a good job today, so yeah. Thank you very much for listening. It was um, an experiment for us because uh, doing a full day workshop of GLS is still something that we have to figure out. Thanks for bearing with us. And I think uh, you guys from Exis London have a, a little survey for you all to to yeah, uh, let us know how you how you experienced the day. Um, I think we have a QR code. Yeah, I'm going to pull that somewhere. up on the screen uh, here. So if you're if you're all fancy scanning that and filling out the survey, that'd be mighty appreciated. And somebody said something about beer. So Wait, was yes. this the was this the virus link? <laughs> <laughs> it's the steal all your crypto link. <laughs>